We're going to be opening the uh, Spadim with Ilu Nishmas from Nassim Zatzal, with whom we've had a long uh, personal as well as professional relationship. Uh, we'll at first hear from Rabbi Shurin, uh, who has a, uh, a nephew, and was getting very close with Rabbi Nassim and uh, literally was working with Rabbi Nassim here at Chappelle's from well before there was a Chappelle's Darchinoa merger. I don't any, I don't want anyone to be cautious that loud, loud, loud. I don't want anyone to be cautious that you can only speak 15 minutes about my uncle. It's hard for me to only speak 15 minutes. I could stand there for a couple of hours easy. <clears throat> The truth of the matter is that I'm here at Chappelle's and Fresh Raquel for 41 years. This is my 41st year. It's practically the only job I ever had. Uh, and of course, the reason being was uh, my uncle. Uh, I would like to think he didn't hire me just because I was a nephew. Maybe the fact that I lasted 41 years shows that he didn't hire me only because I was a nephew. But truthfully speaking, I'm here because of Rav Nassim. Rav Nassim, when I came to Eretz Yisrael in 1977, he found room for me at Chappelle's, which at that time was before Darche Noam. <coughs> Chazal tell us, Rashi quotes it, on the Pasik, Kiadati Achare Moisi, Kiashes Tashisu, the Sartaminadera. Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jewish people, I know that after my passing, after my death, that you'll go off the path. So right away Rashi points out, Vare Kol Yemos Yoshua, Lo Eshrisu. It's clear from the Tanakh that the Jewish people didn't go off till after Yeshua. So what does Moshe mean that after my death, I know you're going to go off? Adam Chavul of Kegufoy. As long as Yeshua was alive and it was as if. Rashi is just an interesting lush in here. He says, Are you near the Moshe? Moshe was already not here. Are you near the Moshe? But, but as long as Yeshua was alive, there was a piece of Moshe that was also alive. Moshe Rabbeinu was also alive. It wasn't easy for me to lose Rabbi Yaakov. It was not easy. When I left Ferret Yisrael, the hardest thing for me was that Rabbi Yaakov was already in his um, late 80s when I came to Eretz Yisrael. And it was hard for me to leave, so hard that I tried something that actually worked. I told Rabbi Yaakov, I said, Zaidi, you know, it's kosha alai to leave you. Will you give me all your ksavim to take along? He had already about 2,000 pages of ksavim. And he said, yes, I was shocked. He said, yes, I'll give it to you, but make an extra copy too. And you know, he didn't have a copy, so uh, I went to Brooklyn College to make copies. So first of all, I had to stand there the whole day, because I was afraid if I leave, right, what's going to happen if I lose a heftel? I, I, lose a, I lose a notebook, I'll get into real trouble. So I stayed there, and also, the lady who was making the copies, she couldn't make your own copies, and the lady made the copies. She didn't know what she was looking at, right? I'll never forget, my mother called up. My mother called up uh, 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 my, my grandfather and she said, it said in Yiddish, but Yitzchok worked very hard on the Ksovim today. So he answered, he says, said, Malka, he said, I worked a lot harder. <laughs> as long as, I say it was hard for me, as long as my uncle was alive, it was still Rav Yaakov, something remaining of Rav Yaakov. You know, I, there were a lot of things which 
he was a Talmud and a Ben, a child and a Talmud. And again, I, I don't mean that he did things exactly like Rabbi Yaakov. I'm, I, I'm not talking about like specific things. But I do want to share with you certain things that Rabbi Yaakov had and that he had. So when I saw that, I saw Rabbi Yaakov left now. Rabbi Yaakov is still alive. Because you know? it's hard for me to, to ever, I, I almost never say Rabbi Yaakov Zatzal. I just say Rabbi Yaakov because it's hard. It's very hard. So I want to go over a few things, and I, I want them to be, you know, if I would be speaking in front of my family, I wouldn't, I would be saying something else, because I'd be talking about an uncle. And an uncle, he was a very special uncle to my whole family, and even to my kids, he was a great uncle, and he was, it, it, it's a duke of honor. he was a great uncle. He was a, when, whenever we spoke about the older uncle, it was only with us in the family. Even though there were still other kids that were alive, it was only Rav Nassim. He had a special place for every one of my children. The first thing is, Rav Nassim was one of the founders of Chappelle College. When I came there to Israel at age 18, he brought me to see Chappelle College. Chappelle College was then run by my uncle and Rabbi Chaim Bravender. And it was the first time I met people who finished university that came to yeshiva. I was a yeshiva guy, so I didn't know much about this, right? It was the first time I had people who were coming from some of the best universities in, in the United States and other places. And I always thought about how come Reb Nossam was picked amongst all the Russia yeshivas in Italy, which there were plenty. Why was he picked to start chapels with Rabbi Bravo? And I never asked my uncle, because I knew what the answer was. Because as we say in Yiddish, it's given up right to mensch. Rabbi Elephant, he understood that he has to send somebody over to start chapels. That's very broad-minded. And that I saw in Rabbi Yaakov. I saw in Rabbi Yaakov that all sorts of people came to Rabbi Yaakov and he was able to relate to them. Uh, some, of the, some of the people who went to Rabbi Yaakov, who told me they went to Rabbi Yaakov, I was quite shocked. Certain people from the, from the YU world, they went to speak to Rabbi Yaakov. Right? To my uncle, something you should appreciate, he was a person that was born in Lithuania. He came as a young child, but he was born in Lithuania, and he learned still by the real Lithuanians. You know, Chaim Vesokr, Ariel Malam, Shmuel Kharkov. He sat in a, in a base medrash of people from the Mir Yeshiva from Shanghai. If you know a little bit about the history, right, they were in Shanghai. And then they came over to America, to an area in Brooklyn where I actually grew up. And I'll never forget, it was the first, you know, it's hard to really describe today, but my father was a rabbi in 1946 in East New York, Brownsville area. And when I walked into the shul, you know, in my father's shul, when I walked into my father's shul, so the Rav had a, a lulav, and then some of the more hush of the people had lulav in, and then there was no lulav on the shulchan, on the shulchan. And that everybody used to use. I walked into Beis Talmud, where the Alta Mir was, first, I was maybe four or five years old, I'll never forget, I saw lulav all over the place. I didn't understand it. I thought, like, every shul has a lulav on the table. You take it. Right? You're talking about people who came from Eastern Europe. The people who came later, the biggest Rosh Hashimers, or Chaim Shmulevitz, came to Eretz Yisrael soon after, or Reb Nachum Bartzovitz came. They started the Mary Yeshiva. This famous Mary Yeshiva started with a few guys. Right? And then the ones who remained in America, who made the base of Talmud, that's who Reb Nassim really learned by. And <clears throat> so he had that bridge from Europe, which was a very important bridge, because so, it's a bridge that I don't see anymore. When I look at a Rosh Hashiva, I don't see that bridge anymore. I hope, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't see the person bridging it, but I'm not even sure there's a bridge anymore. We must have had that. 
He had, on the one hand, he was a great Rosh Hashiva, and he was able to, he was able to, he was a very big Talmud Chacham, but I don't have to talk about it. that's a Dover Pashit. But he was able to sit with guys from, from the American yeshivas, Kamenitz, in Long Beach, and then of course starting Itri, but there's a big Kiddush. He was also able to sit with people who finished university. He was able to relate to them also. Even though he studied under the great Rosh Hashivas of Eastern Europe, the great Talmudim of Eastern Europe. He was very, very broad-minded. You could talk to him about anything, and that always reminded me of Rabbi Yaakov. By the way, when I say anything, I don't mean in total. I mean, you could talk to him about music he was interested in hearing. And he was always able to add something to it. But he was interested. And then there was another thing that Reb Nassim was, my uncle was a machadish. He always looked to be machadish something. A new, what we call a new deher, or a new uptouch. You know, a new way of understanding something. He had a chazal, and that, sometimes it wasn't even a chazal. It was something that was going on in the Jewish world, in the religious world. So he had like an uptouch. I, I remember once speaking to him, speaking to him, about something that Rav Shach had said. And I said to him, Rav Shlomo Zalman, I don't think, would have said it. Shlomo Zalman I wouldn't have said it. So he says, Yitzchak, don't you understand? Rav Shach is the God of Hador for the yeshiva fellow. And Shlomo Zalman Arbach is the God of Hador of Klal Yisrael. They have to do different things. They have to make it. And it just clarified everything for me. That one statement. That, that pikchis, that Rabbi Yaakov had that pikchis that he was able to fataych something, right? A little bit different than you thought. He was able to get a clarity in something. Rabbi Nassim always looked for that. I once went to Rabbi Shlomo Zalman. My uncle sent me to go to Rabbi Shlomo Zalman. There was a new school that started here in Yerushalayim. I wanted to send my oldest daughter there. Hey, Chulamit. So he said, you know, my uncle said, go to Rabbi Shlomo Zalman if you want to. One of his Talmidim was a fellow who they used to ask Shilas to, Rabbi Nevin saw. So he said, go to Rabbi Shlomo Zalman and ask him about it. So I go to Rabbi Shlomo Zalman, I sit down with my wife and my daughter. And Rabbi Shlomo Zalman was the type of idiot, you could just sit in his office and schmooze, you know, you could talk to him. And I said, I want to send my daughter to this new school, but I know that that, you know, that may be, it may be complicated because any new school that opens up that's a little bit different right away, they have a, they put a, they put a, 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 a prohibition on going to the school here in Yerushalayim. So, Rav Shlomo Zaman said to me, we spoke in Yiddish, but he said to me, the, the head of Beis Yaakov was here yesterday, and he spoke about Beit Shulamid, and I can't say anything now. Do what you want. I said, but I, I like that scope of Rosh. He says, I can't say, do what you want. So I went back to Reb and I said to Reb he didn't give me a scope. He says, of course he did. He said, do what you want. If you wanted to send him to the wrong school, he would have said, do what you want. He said, do what you want. That was the pictures of Reb Nassim. He was able to fatayich, what's going on, what's going on. And he was a big medagdik. You should know. That he was a tremendous medagdik, in, in, not just he was a baldigdik, that also was a Rabbi thing. Rabbi Yaakov was a baldigdik, so not so was a baldigdik. But he was a medagdik in everything. He was a medagdik in the times when he comes, and times when he goes. He was always ready if, if he had to be ready at a certain time. All my students from Chappelle's who drove him always said he was always there five minutes before. But he was never late. Him and my aunt were never late. Okay? But he was a medagdik, also in how he davened, and how he said, how he benched. That I saw Rabbi Yaakov, when he was benching, I saw Rabbi Yaakov. Maybe it was a little bit quicker, a little bit. But the dikdu kaloshin was the same. Every word, every letter, how he was medagdik in reading it right, the pronouncing it right, right, that was Rabbi Yaakov. And I saw that, and, and the truth is that I remember with my mother also was like that. Rabbi Yaakov taught them how to read. So my mother at age two, 
my grandfather told me, at age two, he once was in a carriage, like a stagecoach, right? And my mother, my mother didn't have what to do, so he, one of the people in the, in the stagecoach gave her, gave her a tillum. So she started reading tillum. She was two years old, she was reading tillum. Everyone was this spoiler in the stagecoach that she was reading a tillum. The dig took she was reading it. So Rabbi Yaakov made sure, right? So he was, he was a medabdic. I'll never forget when I had to be my first sitter Kedushin. So I went to my father's little brother. And my father said, you should go to Rav Nassim. He knows what goes on there. It's how you're supposed to do it. Go to Rav Nassim. I sat with Rav Nassim two and a half hours. By the way, I have to be Masada Kedushin with, uh, with somebody not from Yushalayim recently, a rabbi with that's not from Yushalayim. And they said to me, you know, you never took the test. Because my they didn't give the test. I'm sure I didn't have to take the test. I don't know what I've gotten on the test. But uh, I, they said, how do you know what to do? So I said, I sat with, with from Nossin Kamenetsky. Right away, he gave me the... I don't know how he knew, but he right away said, no problem. He right away said, you're in. Right? Reb Nossin sat with me for about two and a half hours, and he asked me to take notes. He asked me to take notes. I took notes, and then he said, type it up, and then I want you to show it to me. And when I showed it to him, he says, well, this you didn't do exact like I said. And I didn't get anything wrong, Lemaissa. But it wasn't exact like he said. It was, but, but it wasn't only in halacha. There were so many good ideas, I had to run a city production. There was just like good ideas. Like he says, you come to the hall. He says, the first thing is you want to see the cheder yichud. Well, I see the cheder yichud. Which Rashi goes see the cheder yichud? So I went to a hall. I asked for the cheder yichud. So they said, okay, they showed me. So I said, but doesn't have a lock on it. He says, yeah, we never have a lock on the Ted <laughs> So now I know why Reb Nassim said to me, you have to see the Ted Right? You know, so a lot of different things. He says, you have Aiden? You have Aiden. They have to stay with you the whole time. He says, because all of a sudden, they didn't go missing. You know, you have Aiden for the Ksufa, and then you want them for the Chopa, and you want them, all of a sudden, they go missing. No, no, you stay with me right here. And it was, it was not... A, that's what Rabbi Yaakov's practicality. Rabbi Yaakov was a very practical person. So Nussan had that also. But I want to just end with, I mean, I have plenty more to say, but I know I only have, probably went over my time already. There was, you know, when, when the making of a goggle, which was a book that he wrote that was very controversial in the sense of, the people in Eretz Yisrael felt that it was, it was not, it was not, uh, he didn't show the proper amount of respect to certain people. Just the idea of writing a book, the making of a god, think about it. He wanted to know, he wanted, again, touch up, how does one become a great rabbi? In other words, all the rabbi books you have here in the library, none of them discuss how the person came a great rabbi, except that he learned Torah. Right? But that's the real reason. I think I once saw in a letter by Rav Huttner, Rav Huttner wrote, everybody thinks that the Chafetz Chaim, right, was a little Chafetz Chaim too. But he wasn't. <laughs> it took a lot of work to make a Chafetz Chaim. He wasn't born a little Chafetz Chaim. Right? Rav Nossin wanted to understand about how his father became what he became. And he wanted to tight it up because he loved tightening up something. He made it a little bit complicated for some people, but he loved touching up. He loved like explaining and understanding, right? But I'm going to tell you something. That the 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 on on YouTube, on YouTube when they have the 45 minute for for that they interviewed him to defend the the book that he wrote, right? So the last 30 seconds is that all you have to listen to. There you see the biggest people. Some he gets takes questions, and someone says to him, you know, why do I have to know about divresh liliyim, things that are negative about, you know, about rabbis? Why do I have to know about that? So Reb said, without thinking, there wasn't even like a second. He said, because you have to know that even though you have dvarim shliliyim, you have negative traits, you could still become a god hadar. And I saw the fellow interviewed him. The bulb lit up. Like, look, the bulb lit up. And Ramnasan said it completely, completely serious, and it penetrated. Only go to the last 30 seconds, that's all you need. Everything else is complicated. I want to say that for, for the Balchufa world, 
right? Which Rav Nossam was extremely fond of. And he completely related to the Balchuv world. And it didn't matter, you know, if the person was this type of Balchuv, that, but one thing. Or when Rav Nossam, even though he was a Medagdic, he wasn't Kavit. I'll end with that. He was not a, ho he was not a heavy person. You can have someone who's an Ovid Hashem, and it feels heavy. You know, he's serving God. He's a Baal Avoida, right? <coughs> well, for Yaakov, he never felt that. So Yaakov was serving God. You don't have to worry. He was doing Dr. Mitzvahs, all mitzvahs. But it didn't seem like you had to, like, really shuckle hard for it. You didn't have to, you know. It was very natural, and it was very normal. And Reb Nussin inherited that personality. I, I want to say, I, I'm not going to talk too much because I don't want to get into trouble, but I spoke to Rabbi Yaakov about Rabbi Nassim. I spoke to Rabbi Yaakov about Rabbi Nassim. So I know what Rabbi Yaakov felt about Rabbi Nassim, but I, I'd rather not say it publicly. But I know what he felt about him. And I could tell you that as long as Rabbi Nassim was alive, I used to see Rabbi Yaakov all the time. And for me, it's going to be very hard. Because more of Rabbi Yaakov passed away now. Deborah knows it is not me. So, I, I, I would like to, you should understand and appreciate what kind of person we have here. Right? Because how many people have you ever even heard of him? Ah, some people heard of him, he got famous because he's making of a god because he's got the book up in the So, But you don't know. But, but when Rabbi Yitzchak Lerner took his whole school to see Rabbi Nassim, he didn't take to see anybody else. Medrash Moriah was taken to see Rabbi Nassim, and they had such a a leer from it. It's from Nussin, but whoever walked in the house, he knew how to speak to them. So if 18-year-old girls walk in the house, he knew how to speak to them. If a college graduate, if a professor were, he also knew how to speak to them. If a big rug walked in the house, everybody he knew how to speak to it. Everybody liked him. That was the interesting thing. Everybody liked him. Don't he didn't like him. And that's what I want you to know. What we lost over here was, number one, the bridge from 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 that old Eastern Europe. And that bridge is not just the learning, it's the normalcy. Rabbi Ariely Mal was a very normal person. Rabbi Chaim Shemulevitz, you get the most normal person you can ever get. They were all Bali Avodah, they were all working in Torah and mitzvahs, and working hard. But they were, there was a certain normalcy you felt you could relate to. That's what we lost here. We lost from